in the last video, I was focused on the watt hour readings I was getting from the test battery. With the equipment I have, I was hoping to get an accuracy of plus or minus 2%, and that is with the assumption that the average of my meters will be within 1% of the true value, and that will be close enough to evaluate the batteries I will be testing. When comparing battery to battery, that will be much more accurate. The actual watt hour results might be up to 2% different than my measured value, but I expect battery to battery test to be well under 1% error. But I needed a reference battery, and it appears Sony doesn't sell the DualSense battery. Kinda surprised me, but then again they don't expect and likely don't want anyone to take the controller apart. So that left me with the only option I saw to get a brand new Sony battery, buy a new controller. So that is what I did. At first I was going to take the battery from the new controller and use it on the test setup with my old controller, but I thought this would be a good time to see if there is a difference in the discharge and charge rate of the controllers. There are quite a few years between the manufacturer of these two. So I made another battery extension cable, and it was a little painful drilling a hole in the bottom of a brand new controller, but it was needed. And I believe some of the results are very interesting, so I thought I would share. Just for the sequence of events, when the controller arrived I plugged it up to a USB charger. Once it charged I then opened up the controller and removed the battery, and prepared the controller for testing. And this is the very first discharge of the Sony battery, and I'm using the new DualSense controller. This controller has a BDM-050 motherboard, which is the latest version I've seen mentioned. And I will be comparing it to a controller with a BDM-020 motherboard. Here is the controller turned on and being used in the PS5 menu, or just setting and not being touched, a little of both. This seems to be the baseline with no game active. Here I'm focused on the average milliwatt value, and it's right around 300 milliwatts. And here's the old controller, before the game is started. I am using the controller to move around the PS5 menu, that does raise this some, but idle on the new controller is around 300 milliwatts and idle on the old controller is around 400 milliwatts, a huge difference. Here is the old controller setting idle in Borderlands 3, and not on any menus, just idle in the game. It's very consistent, running right around 470 milliwatts, and here it is getting ready to shut down. Some 3.371 volt readings pop up, and there it goes, just a tiny bit under 3.4 volts. I'm going to call shutdown at 3.371 volts. Now here is the new controller, very close to shutdown and setting idle in the same game. It's only pulling 345 milliwatts, over 120 milliwatts less than the old controller. That really is very impressive. I'm going to call shutdown at 3.392 volts. Voltage dips lower, but a couple of seconds before the controller shuts down, current seems to spike up a bit. I'm going to contribute that to the controller shutting itself off. I haven't noticed that in the older controller. Only more testing will tell. As you can see, total power delivered was very close to 6 watt hours for this first run of the battery. This discharge run was charged without my measurement device attached. Measuring the charge current will decrease the total charge the battery receives. And if we take a look at the discharge of the battery in the old controller. With this discharge run being charged with me measuring the charge, I'm at about 5.8 watt hours, a bit less than 200 milliwatt hours of difference. Now this did answer my question about the rating on Sony's battery. I suspected Sony would use the charge cutoff and discharge cutoff of the controller to rate the usable power of the battery, and they did, and good on them for that. The replacement battery I bought from Amazon listed 9.7 watt hours on it. That is not the usable power of the battery. I didn't expect it to be. But this is a very good example of why the watt hour listed on a battery can't be used to determine how the battery will perform in the controller. I think the best watt hour reading I've gotten out of it is around 5.4 watt hours. So I would say it is close to the OEM, but it does look to come up a bit short. Lifespan of the batteries is going to be hard to test. I'm going to need a lot of fixtures, and they are going to have to cycle night and day, charging and discharging the batteries. Sony is a longtime manufacturer of lithium ion cells, and I doubt that can be said for the makers of these replacement batteries. 
so life cycle is going to have to be an important part of testing the batteries. Maybe I find a battery with 8 watt hours, but if it has to be replaced every 3 months, that won't cut it. I haven't touched on the rumble or feedback power draw of the new controller. The old controller would peak at over 600 milliamps with heavy feedback. For the new controller, I only saw one reading a little over 500 milliamps. It is just a much more efficient controller. This may be my imagination. I don't think the vibration and rumble from the new controllers are quite as strong as the old one. Trigger resistance seems about the same, best I can tell at this point. A few hours of playing is all I really have on it. If controller runtime is very important to you, and you have an older version with a battery that is starting to wear out, it might be worth it to replace the entire controller. Certainly a $75 controller is a lot more money than a $15 battery. But the new controller ran for 14 hours, granted only about 4 of that was actual playing. It is something to consider if runtime is of great importance. For me, I would replace the battery. But with which battery? That I intend to find out. Thank you for watching.